Good morning. My name is Kingsley Morgan, um, Deputy Governor of the Central Bank uh, of Nigeria. Um, I don't have a, a slide uh, to present this morning, but I just want to speak uh, broadly um, on the topic of the Nigerian economy within the context of emerging Africa growth markets. Um, I'm sure a lot of us are familiar with Nigeria, a uh, country of 167 billion people. Um, Six million. million. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, not even China. Um, yeah, 167 million uh, people. Um, GDP of uh, 240 billion dollars. Um, GDP per capita of 1,500 dollars. Um, so it's quite a big economy, uh, the second biggest in Sub-Saharan Africa, we believe. And of course, we are actually in the process of undertaking what we call a rebasing of the gross domestic product, which is to say we need to measure more accurately the various contributions to the country's uh, GDP growth. We haven't done that since about 1990 or so. Uh, so our GDP, in fact, we believe is very much out of date. And by the time we rebase the GDP, uh, taking into, con con you know, into um, context much more current data, uh, we suspect that our GDP uh, may uh, closely rival, will in fact closely rival that of South Africa and possibly overtake it within a few years to come. Um, I wanted to just put Nigeria in context uh, and to talk about what the situation is today uh, with the emerging markets and Nigeria in that context. I think we all know that global growth today um, is driven very, very significantly by emerging markets, despite recent declines in growth. Uh, but when you compare that to what's happening in the more advanced economies, it's still very significant uh, growth. And I think the fact that the world economy is witnessing growth that is estimated variously at rates between three to four percent is certainly due to strong growth in emerging centers of global wealth. And in this context, of course, we know the importance of the BRICS, uh, the BRIC countries and what's called the next 11 countries. And Nigeria is one of those next 11 countries. Uh, their importance in output, trade, investment is, is definitely coming to the fore. And their potential has been expanded, especially after the recent uh, global financial crisis and the global economic recession. Um, interestingly, the non-BRICS and even non-N11 developing and emerging markets, which are found mainly in Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, Central and Eastern Europe, the Middle East and the Western Hemisphere, have also made uh, serious efforts at economic recovery post-crisis and have accounted for a substantial uh, share, of a significant share of world output and trade. Now, the IMF, their 2013 Regional Macroeconomic Review, has projected an optimistic picture uh, for countries in Sub-Saharan Africa with an estimated growth rate of 5.4% in 2013. Um, that's slightly lower than the average rate of 6.4%. That was uh, the, the figure between 20, 2004 and 2008. But it also remains strong uh, relative to the growth experiences of many European countries, as of course we know. And available IMF data uh, suggests that growth in five selected uh, African countries that I, I will use uh, as examples for my uh, discussion, and those countries are Angola, Ghana, uh, Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa. And IMF data uh, suggests that growth in those five countries has averaged 5.9% in 2012. And that's down from 8.2% in the period 2004 to 2008. Annual inflation uh, in these countries has also remained largely in the single digits. Um, as Mr. Nair, Mr. Nair talked about uh, the, the, the battle to keep the inflation figures in Ghana under uh, within single digits. Uh, so inflation in these countries has largely remained at single digit uh, rates, down from 12% in 2012 and uh, now um, 
basically under 9%. Um, so although the projected growth rate is expected to fall to about 6% by the end of 2014, and this slowdown will be driven uh, largely by growth declines in Nigeria and South Africa, these are the two region's largest economies, the estimated growth rates of 3.3% for South Africa and 7.6% for Nigeria, uh, and it's up from minus 1.5% for South Africa and 7% for Nigeria in 2009, these growth rates still remain strong by global standards. Um, and so we have shown that African countries have broadly been resilient uh, since the global uh, crisis. And uh, on average, as I said, most African countries have experienced modest inflation uh, over time, steadier exchange rates. I think you only need to look at what's happening today in the currency markets. You look at Brazil uh, spending $60 billion to protect its currency. You look at the Indian rupee, uh, which has experienced uh, quite a very significant decline. And you will see that our exchange rates in Africa, and certainly in Nigeria, uh, have done rather very well. We have much, we have risen middle classes, uh, smaller foreign debts following the debt cancellation programs in 2006 and 2007. So the overall macroeconomic picture uh, for Nigeria in the context of sub-Saharan Africa uh, has actually been quite uh, significantly Im improved in the last decade. And this is attributable to stable macroeconomic uh, environment better coordination between monetary and fiscal policies in line with the transformation agenda of the Nigerian government. Uh, our economic growth rate uh, is projected at 7.2% in 2013. Uh, it's down from an average of 8.5% between 2004 and 2008, but still quite significant. Um, so that slight decline, uh, notwithstanding, uh, the growth rate remains strong uh, relative to the growth path of most advanced economies. Now, if you, uh, the, the growth that we're experiencing in Nigeria is driven largely by non-oil uh, exports uh, at this time, which is good news for us because one of the major weaknesses of Nigeria's economy, as we have always criticized ourselves at home, is that the country has been too dependent on oil and therefore is exposed, of course, to macroeconomic shocks that come from uh, swings in the price, in the oil, global oil price. And so the fact that our strong growth is now driven by the increased performance of, um, of uh, non-oil uh, exports, um, which is projected to grow at 7.5% in 2013, exceeding the average for sub-Saharan Africa, uh, is quite, is quite uh, encouraging uh, for us. We've had better coordination between monetary and fiscal authorities in Nigeria, uh, and so we've maintained much more disciplined uh, fiscal regimes. Uh, our monetary policy has increasingly been tight. Uh, since 2011, our monetary policy rate has stood at about 12% since about November 2011. And, and the reason is to be able to maintain uh, a control on inflation, uh, to be able to control tight liquidity, which comes into the economy a lot because of oil, uh, oil money, and a rather uh, expansionary fiscal stance by the government, especially in 2010. And so from 2011, we began to maintain in the Central Bank of Nigeria a very tight uh, monetary policy. Um, our Central Bank, of course, is, is independent uh, operationally, uh, and we have actually made some very, very important strides. I'll talk a little bit about the banking sector in a little while. Uh, but we have a monetary policy committee made up of 12 members as well. And we are extremely transparent in the way we conduct our monetary policy. Not only do we uh, address, does the governor address the press after the monetary policy committee meetings to explain the basis for our decisions, but in fact, each member's uh, personal statement is published uh, for everyone in the world to see. Uh, this is done within a week of, of the meeting. And so we, you can go to our website and see the decisions of the Monetary Policy Committee and every member's um, reasoning uh, in reaching those decisions. Now, we have, uh, um, as I was saying, maintained a very tight uh, monetary policy. Uh, we've tried to be very strict with controlling liquidity. We recently 
uh, issued a new rule after our monetary policy committee meeting, uh, imposing a 50% cash reserve ratio on public sector deposits in Nigerian banks. And we've had the banks screaming murder. Um, but there's a reason we've, we've done this. Uh, we've done this because we feel that there's too much liquidity in the system. We are not comfortable with the fact that um, a lot of Nigerian banks pursue government deposits as a business strategy. And we feel that this exposes the country to macroeconomic risk because if, if the price of oil crashes for any reason, that means that those banks will not be able to maintain liquidity uh, and there could be uh, a banking crisis. So, so in, in order to forestall this type of situation, we on our side as the monetary authority have taken uh, these kinds of, 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 uh, of measures. We all know recently as well uh, that Nigeria has established a sovereign wealth fund uh, which has helped to insulate the country from sharp swings in the price of oil. That sovereign wealth fund is still relatively small. It's got a billion dollars in it, but it's a beginning. And it's a movement uh, away from fiscal dominance. It's a movement away from unplanned uh, spending of oil revenues. Um, there, there are three components of that sovereign wealth fund. You have the, the infrastructure fund. Uh, you have the, uh, the fund for, for future uh, generations uh, as well there. Um, and of course, you have the uh, uh, what, what, what we call, um, I think I talked about the infrastructure component of that fund. And this is, it's a bit rare to find a sovereign wealth fund uh, have as part of its mandate spending on domestic infrastructure. This is because, of course, we recognize the importance of infrastructure uh, to Nigeria's development, and that's a major challenge for most African countries because that's one of the major um, barriers to foreign investment and inter-African, intra-African trade uh, in, in our countries. Now, um, like I said, we have witnessed a lot of stability in our foreign exchange market due to prudent uh, monetary policy management. Um, I talked, uh, I said somewhere that our uh, monetary policy has been a bit of a Faustian bargain um, between um, uh, Nigeria and uh, uh, portfolio investors. Uh, and I want to clarify that uh, comment uh, to say the reason is simple. Uh, the stability of our foreign exchange is very important to us because the country depends a lot on oil. Um, it's also an import-driven economy at this stage. And so it's important to maintain a very healthy flow of foreign exchange into the country. We have quite significant foreign reserves at this point. Our foreign reserves are $47 billion. Um, so that's a very healthy foreign reserve size. That's about the same as, as South Africa uh, at this point, and quite much larger than many other uh, sub-Saharan African growth economies. Um, so we try to maintain that stability so that you know, the importation does not become a channel for importing inflation. Uh, because if, uh, if uh, the foreign currency is not, if the foreign uh, exchange rate is not stable, uh, we will have imported inflation. And this is something that we want to avoid since there's a lot of importation that goes on in the economy. Our banking sector uh, is of course quite large. Uh, we have in Nigeria 24 commercial banks with total assets of 21 trillion naira. That's about 150 billion dollars, uh, the assets of Nigeria's banks. They have 57 subsidiaries in 31 countries. Uh, so our banks are also quite global or multinational. Many of them have a wide reach across African countries and they are a very important part of, uh, of Nigeria's economy. We, unlike Ghana, it's very interesting uh, to listen to the Deputy Governor of the Bank of Ghana because Nigeria has gone a bit in the opposite direction. We used to have universal banking. Um, that started in 2001, but in more recent years, after the banking crisis of 2008 and 2009 and the global financial crisis, we found that that model has not served Nigeria very well. And so we've moved away uh, from universal banking. We, in fact, abolished it because we felt in our own country, the experience we had was that it led to a, a concentration of risk. 
when banks became financial supermarkets, but the regulatory capacity wasn't strong enough for an economy as big as Nigeria to have banks that can be everything from banks to pension funds to stockbrokers to asset managers. Um, a lot of regulatory arbitrage was taking place and we felt that it was necessary to stop this. So, so we abolished universal banking uh, and we now have uh, uh, commercial banks, we have investment banks and we have specialized banks such as development banks and, and mortgage banks and so on. But we've led major reforms in our banking sector that have been even well ahead of what you have had in, in, in advanced economies. Um, and a number of factors or uh, characteristics about those reforms are quite spectacular. One of them, of course, was the decisiveness of the intervention of Nigeria's central bank following the global financial crisis in 2009, which led to the removal of the CEOs of eight banks. Five, five of them were removed in one day. And so we began uh, the, the trend, which is still slow in many countries, of calling bankers to account uh, for some of the uh, sharp practices we felt contributed to the problems that at least one third of Nigeria's banks had in 2008 and 2009. Uh, we've increased uh, very strong measures uh, in corporate governance, uh, risk management. We now use risk-based supervision of, of the banking sector. Our capital markets uh, are doing quite well. They're quite uh, stable, um, but they, they were a bit shaky after the global financial crisis when foreign investors uh, ran, ran for safety. And so this is always the challenge uh, for African economies opening up and safeguarding themselves. Where is the balance? Um, at that time, foreign investors made up about 60 to 65 percent of the Nigerian capital markets. And so when they took a flight to safety, the market crashed in 2008. Uh, it's being built back up, but we are emphasizing the need for a lot of investments in the Nigerian stock market to also be by Nigerians. Uh, and of course you know that Nigeria is leading a major uh, cross-African investment spree. We have a number of major multinationals and multinational players like Aliko Dangote uh, and, and a number of others who, of course, our banks, Nigerian banks, are very active across Africa. Uh, Dangote is also investing, they've now uh, set up uh, cement plants in about 15 African countries. So a lot of the increase in foreign investment in Africa is also led by Africans themselves, including Nigeria. Nigeria is very much, very much at the forefront of this. Uh, but in terms of the banks, I mean, our banking reform basically has had four pillars, and that is one, to enhance the quality of banks uh, with a regulatory framework overhaul, um, improved risk management and corporate governance and so on. The second pillar has been to restore financial stability. And we, in this context, we set up the Asset Management Corporation of Nigeria, which was quite a unique, a bad bank, which basically bought up uh, all the bad loans uh, from Nigerian banks. And in this process, we've been able to reduce the non-performing loan ratios of Nigerian banks from 33% in 2010 to under 5% as we speak today. And so we have achieved quite a stable banking sector through these reforms. The third pillar of the banking sector reforms was to enable the evolution of a healthy uh, financial sector by improved payment systems and so on. And the fourth pillar of those reforms is to make sure that banks contribute to the real economy, which is a challenge you have even in advanced countries such as this country. Uh, I always smile every time I read uh, the, the struggle uh, between the British government, the British, British regulators, and British banks. And that's the question of how can banks actually lend uh, more to the real economy and to small businesses. It's a challenge for us. And of course, in order to meet that challenge, one of the things Nigeria's central bank has done is to remain very active in the development space. Uh, we've tried to create a number of special initiatives to be able to provide uh, credit to the real sector, especially small and medium enterprises who have problems accessing capital for many reasons. But one of the problems we have in Nigeria is that there's too much of a reliance on banks for capital. About 90% of capital in Nigeria comes from the banks. We think the economy is large enough and there's room for foreign investors to come in with private equity, a lot of room to come in with venture capital, most especially, 
Uh, a lot of small and medium enterprises need venture capital. They don't have it. That's a huge space that's open for foreign investment in Nigeria. Uh, we feel, of course, that in attracting foreign investment, uh, we should be strategic. Uh, foreign investors should try to come into areas that are win-win situations, not just coming into the extractive industries, but also coming into areas that actually create employment and, and create capital flows in the Nigerian economy. And that's why I'd like to uh, mention specifically the uh, uh, opportunities that exist in the area of venture capital. Infrastructure, huge area. We know that there are power reforms now going on. And those power reforms, when they come on stream within the next three to five years, Nigeria's economy is going to be transformed. The opportunities are huge in Nigeria. We complain about being a monoproduct economy, depending a lot on oil. But as I said, there's been a lot of growth in non-oil exports. And when the power sector reforms become much more advanced, the huge entrepreneurial uh, 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 tendencies and abilities of Nigerians are going to be unleashed. And we foresee in another five to 10 years an economy that will be fundamentally transformed as a lot of manufacturing comes on stream, uh, as a lot of small and medium businesses uh, take off. Because the problem now is that when people uh, set up small businesses, they spend a lot of their money uh, trying to provide power for themselves. But with the privatization of the power companies that's going on now and so far has been very successful, we are looking at a future that's very different from, uh, from what it is today. Um, so, you know, Nigeria is a very, very inviting growth story. Uh, and, and we welcome a lot of foreign investment. Um, and we welcome investment in strategic areas. We need a lot more investment in Nigeria in the area of education. Um, human capital development is important to building the skills that will make economic growth sustainable. Um, a lot of times, foreign investments in African countries are looking for the quick kill. Uh, but we think increasingly that foreign investment should be much more than that. It should be a partnership in which foreign investors can make some money, but also contribute to long-term growth for, for the economies of African countries. And investing in education is a very important uh, part of this, of, this, uh, of this trajectory. So that's an overview of, of where Nigeria is uh, at, at this point. We think it's a very promising uh, outlook. Um, the recent IMF World Economic Outlook uh, indicates that global output will remain subdued in the second half of 2013 and into 2014. And that's due to lower domestic demand uh, slower growth in developed economies and protracted recession in the Eurozone, although we see a lot of those economies now beginning to pick up. One of the consequences for that pickup will be uh, uh, sustained demand uh, for commodities from African countries, sustained demand for, for oil, but in the area of oil, because of the development of uh, shale gas and, and fracking and all that, we are beginning to see uh, a drop in the demand for Nigerian oil from our traditional Western partners. And so we've shifted uh, to dealing with Asian countries mostly. Um, but it's important that we move our economy away from dependence on oil. Uh, this is not a problem unique to Nigeria. Even Saudi Arabia and a lot of other countries uh, are having this problem. And so that's why the power sector reforms I spoke about that are going on in Nigeria are so important because as they come on stream, we will see a natural tendency, a natural ability to diversify the economy uh, into uh, other, other areas. We also uh, anticipate that when the quantitative easing ends, as it inevitably will, um, there will be a bit of a shift of capital uh, which has come to Nigeria a lot in a search for yield. I mean, with 12% uh, as our monetary policy um, rate, a lot of portfolio investors have found Nigeria to be very prof profitable. Um, but when QE ends and interest rates rise in, in some of these more mature economies, we expect some of that money uh, to, 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 uh, to go back, and some capital may leave. Um, but we are comfortable at 47%, at $47 billion. Uh, of, of foreign reserves, and we think will be just fine. So Nigeria, major growth area, major economy on the African horizon, uh, and has uh, overall uh, performed uh, much better than a lot of other economies uh, in Africa. Thank you very much.